rather grand title. I think it's a bit ambitious, but we'll see how we go. Um, and Ron's already beautifully led us through a practice, so I'll move on from there. But I did want to invite us into a couple of sensibilities for the conference. And one is about vulnerability. I think it is beautiful if we purposefully kind of orient ourselves towards vulnerability in both offering our work for the people who are going to be doing that, but also in the kind of speaking and listening we're going to be doing, sharing our ideas, challenging, connecting, opening, all the things we're going to be doing inside ourselves as we move through these few days. And I wanted to start actually reading a little poem about vulnerability. And it's by one of my favourite poets, Hafiz, who wrote in the 13th century. He says, admit something. Everyone you see, you say, love me. Of course, you don't do this out loud. Otherwise, someone would call the cops. <laughs> Still though, think about this, this great pull in us to connect. Why not become the one who lives with a full moon in each eye that is always saying, with that sweet moon language, what every other eye is dying to hear. And I think there's something about this mindfulness work, which is at heart, it's about love and connection, I think, and probably that mission in some way has brought us all here. We're interested in connecting with others with this kind of flavour of intimacy and kind of vulnerability in a way. So maybe, yeah, I'd love us if we could bring that forth over the next morning and a couple of days with each other. The other, um, so these are invitations, you can stay off, you know, however you need to be, of course, over the, over the time. The other thing is about complexity. We're going to be hearing from different paradigms, so Buddhist psychology, other kinds of mindfulness, science, really different kind of orientations. So it, I think it's really helpful if at the beginning we kind of go, okay, this is going to be complex, I'm going to be challenged, I'm going to be confused, good. Let's be confused together. So mindfulness, Ron's given us a beautiful definition which I think really captures so much of the quality of a moment of practice. And mindfulness is everywhere, as he's mentioned. So hopefully we're not yet at having reality TV shows. Um, <laughs> comparing people's right mindfulness and <laughs> evaluating the clinging to self. May it not be so, but I'm sure it's coming, you know, it'll be coming. So I wanted to start with offering a few maps of things that have been meaningful to me. I've practiced in the Theravadan tradition, so Vipassana and also Zen, and, I'm, and lots of yoga as well. Uh, and so I'm going to be offering some maps from that tradition, which have informed most of the kind of ways we're practicing mindfulness these days. Uh, so I think of it as an investigation into experience, most broadly. And one way that the Theravadan tradition offers this investigation is through the four foundations of mindfulness. And these could be seen as lenses. They're kind of, and they'll be familiar to you, even if you haven't you know, studied in that tradition, because they really inform a lot of what we're teaching in all of our mindfulness courses. So the first one is mindfulness of the body, and Ron really emphasised this. So it's about a focused, attention practice and often. So you're attempting to focus on the body or the breath, the senses in a kind of focused way and it generates interoception. It generates the capacity to know what's going on inside. And these are some of the practices you guys will be familiar with that we invite people into when we're using this lens of the body. What is happening? What is arising right now in my bodily experience? The hedonic tone of any experience is always accessible if we kind of check it out, pay attention to it. And this is just the experience of recognising whether something's pleasant or unpleasant or neutral. 
and it's a profound practice because we have a nervous system that is used to moving away automatically from something that's unpleasant. It's really adaptive, isn't it? You don't want to have a, you know, say there's a burning hot plate and I've got my hand on it and I go, oh, I'm going to be mindful, smell the burning flesh, you know. <laughs> no, that would be idiotic. You want a nervous system that goes, no, that's really bad for me, that's really unpleasant, I'm moving away from that. If we live our whole life like that, if we're organised, and we all are, in a way that automatically moves away from the unpleasant. We're going to be moving away from information that's really helpful. Anxiety, sadness, depression, anger. Mindfulness is a training if we can help ourselves start this approach mentality towards things that are pleasant or unpleasant or neutral. Often we miss out on what's neutral, right? So this is part of the training. This is a lens. What's in my body right now, in my mind, what's pleasant, what's unpleasant, what's neutral? cultivating this approach mentality towards our experience. And it leads to non-reactivity, this practice, and it leads to much more tolerance of our affects and our emotions. So third foundation, really familiar, I'm sure, to all of us. Uh, often it involves a more open monitoring practice because that's when you kind of capture thoughts, watching those things bubble up in whatever space they seem to arise, the head, the heart, mind, uh, and it gives us some clarity about our experience and the connectedness between sensations, hedonic tone, emotions, mind states, ways of thinking, patterns of thinking. And we're really starting in this foundation to get a sense of perspective, like we're able to start noticing thoughts and emotions as phenomena to be observed, not completely being fused with uh, that experience, if that makes sense. The fourth foundation is profound also and a little bit complex, but basically it's opening us up. Once we've got a bit of grounding in how to pay attention to experience, we can really step back further and get some more perspective and start making really wise choices about how I want to move towards things that are wholesome in my life and away from things that sort of bugger things up. So we're getting more capacity to kind of make choices that are going to be helpful and reduce suffering for ourselves and other people involves a really looking into the existential and phenomenological nature of reality. What is this thing that we're immersed in as, you know, these particular smart mammals that we are? And the kind of fruits that come out of this practice using this lens, really being stepping back and being able to see phenomena as it arises and passes away, is to do with non-identification. Again, this defusing, us not so much being the centre of the universe, but really seeing the complexity of all the causes and conditions that are giving rise to our experience in this moment. And also, the fruits are about equanimity, having much more capacity to be non-reactive, but open-hearted about what we know and see, both in ourselves, our own experience, but also in the world. So I wanted to run through an article that has really helped me in in framing and understanding my work and in also I'm involved in training mindfulness teachers and it's really been helpful in thinking about what the hell is this thing? It is simple, as Ron said, but it's also complex. So this article was written by a guy called John Teasdale. He's a professor of psychology. He was one of the founders of NBCT and he's a Vipassana teacher and he's smart as hell, one of those people that you just you know envy the amount of neurons they've got. And Michael Shaskelson is an MBSR teacher, long-standing practice, but also has been offering this in the business world quite a bit. So they're sort of well-placed to kind of offer a contemporary view and to really unpack some of the Buddhist psychology in a way that's really comprehensible and able to be known by us. So they say the first way that mindfulness transforms suffering is through where we place our attention. So we're training our attention to be where we want it to be. So when we're with our kids, we can actually pay attention to their needs. We're not worrying about work. When we're at work, we're not feeling guilty because we weren't present with the kids. We're kind of getting more capacity to really be present, as Ron was talking about. Uh, we're interrupting autopilot and we're cultivating this present moment awareness. So a skillful way, a little example might be, say, say a colleague rings you at about nine o'clock at night and you're kind of angry, like, what the hell? I'm about to go to bed, this is annoying. And they're kind of a bit blaming and angry at you for something that happened last week and it's sort of like, really? No. 
So you get off the phone quickly, you try to go to bed and you're just seething, right? You've got a florid, you know, wrangle of thoughts just tumbling through and, you know, revenge, blame, criticism of the, you know, the last three years working with them, all the times that they've really pissed you off, um, is going through your head. And you think, okay, hmm, I could keep ruminating like that. I could just, in an autopilot kind of way, keep badgering on in that way. But I could stop, take a breath, bring my attention to the breath, the body. And we know that this kind of attention training really regulates emotional states. It really regulates this kind of proliferation. So that would be a skillful use of where we place our attention. Pretty simple use of mindfulness. One of the near enemies um, in some forms of Buddhism, there's this beautiful uh, idea of things that are good for us can have a near enemy. And one of the near enemies of this kind of level of mindfulness training is experiential avoidance. And you may have heard this, we may have done it ourselves, of, oh, I've got this anxiety thing, and I just tried to get back to the breath, because I didn't want to feel the anxiety, I didn't want to know about the anxiety. That's experiential avoidance, isn't it? Trying to use a technique of mindfulness to kind of not experience. Because we might need to know about that anxiety. Not, anxiety is not just a thing, it's information about our world, our, the people we're with, how we view ourselves. We don't want to cut off and just do a technique to shut things down. The second way that mindfulness meditation practice can transform suffering is how we place our attention. And this is to do with the attitudes we bring to it, this kind of equanimity, curiosity, open-heartedness. So we're really saying yes, it's the cultivation of this approach mentality to our experience. And we're holding what's aversive in us, the bits of suffering that are in us, alongside curiosity or kindness or open-heartedness. It's very hard for anxiety or anger to continue on untouched if we're holding that experience, that awful experience, with these other qualities. Very transformative and literally there's some you know, really good brain science now that says this is actually what's happening. We're holding it in working memory, we're transforming those states. The next time they arise, and if you do this many, many times in practice, the states of curiosity are going to be there as well, open-heartedness, etc. Uh, it has a near enemy that's really, because mindfulness has got so famous these days, but yeah, the near enemy comes about because people don't practice maybe enough. So this is a cognitive thing, you know? Uh, I'll just be loving towards my hatred of my mother-in-law or something, you know? <laughs> you know, and think that, tick, that's done. No, actually, it's going to take a bit more time to do this knitting together in working memory of that irritation and that, um, the, the kind of what we're trying to cultivate. Huh? So the third way that mindfulness can help us transform our suffering is to do with the view we bring to it. And hopefully in the context that we're teaching, this thing kind of bubbles up out of practice. It doesn't have to be kind of uh, technically or uh, doesn't have to have a heavy handed kind of philosophical educative element, but it kind of bubbles up when people start practicing, they start to get to know this. Um, they start to be interested in the bigger context and start to maybe have less of a sense of clinging to a sense of I, me and my. They start feeling the kind of liberative elements of being a little bit, again, this cognitive diffusion, this, this being able to see your experience as uh, some of the metaphors that are powerful for people is seeing your experience as like arising like the weather. I don't have to identify with it, the moment of sadness or worry or pain, I can actually have a little bit more freedom around it and see that it's going to pass. It's impermanent, impersonal, it's arising, it's passing. In MBSR we sometimes use this little adage of life sucks and sings, everything changes, don't take it personally. <coughs> and again, the near enemy for this is, again, just cognitive, it can be banal, right? So it's, it's all over the internet, banal things like this, like don't take it personally, even, you know, don't sweat the small stuff, really? If it's right in your life, first you have to take it really personally and do the work of engaging and connecting and um, having a relationship with that. And then these freedoms can start kind of arising. So I wanted to now just point to some paradigms that we are immersed in. All of us in this room are immersed in some way or another, even if we don't feel expert in them. Uh, I was asked to talk a few years ago about 
mindfulness training of teachers, so teaching, how, how do we train people up to be good mindfulness teachers? And I was looking at these two paradigms of mindfulness and science that we're all immersed in, and, and they, they offer quite different kind of perspectives on the, what we're doing here. Huh? They've got quite different theoretical frameworks, values frameworks, etc. And now we've got another paradigm that's massively impacting our work. And we're all involved in this. We're all having to find our place in a relationship between the kind of Buddhist psychology, the mindfulness aspect of our work, the science aspect of our work, and also the market. How do we position ourselves? How do we communicate what we're doing? How do we make a livelihood out of um, our work? So, just want to wander through these uh, paradigms quite quickly, but just to sort of let them land and we can start reflecting maybe over the whole weekend about where we kind of live and what's important to us. So the first one I would call Buddhist psychology. So, and a metaphor for this might be, for engaging with this, might be a path. And it's the practices and teachings of mindfulness that we're familiar with. And it has specific concerns, the concerns of relieving suffering, investigating subjectivity, intersubjectivity, and it's a phenomenological method. It's really interested in experience. It's a first-person psychology. It's interested in my experience. Does doing this thing help me tomorrow and the next day and next year? That's the kind of framework. It's experiential, it's pragmatic, and it's embodied. Not this just cognitive thing, huh? It's a practice that changes our body, like yoga might or Pilates might. <coughs> and these are the values. Reducing suffering, wholeness, wisdom, compassion. And I just wanted to say a little thing about kind of Buddhist psychology. There are many, many kinds of Buddhisms, as you guys are probably well aware. And they have real differences. And they exist in a historical kind of framework. They've unfolded. So a little bit of history that I found out a few years ago was the kind of um, mindfulness we know today was really dependent on some Buddhist monasteries in Burma and Sri Lanka and Laos really opening up their monasteries to let lay people practice. Not Westerners, just ordinary. Because up till then, ordinary folk, ordinary lay people didn't practice meditation. Their, their role in the community was to support the monasteries and uh, by economic, political uh, forces. And we're part of that. We have a responsibility and relationship to that, huh? And I think we, yeah, it's great to take that quite seriously, I think, because it matters. So that's the Buddhist psychology, the path. So science has been really important, huh, in this explosion of mindfulness. Uh, John Kabat-Zinn started all those 40 years ago, and it was great that he was a scientist. He wasn't a health professional, but he thought, I'm going to research this and see what happens. Could I make it secular enough? Could I make it short enough that people would actually do it, but intensive enough that something would happen, change could happen? And he researched it. And even though people's emphysema, their end-stage cancer, their chronic pain mightn't have changed much, their anxiety, depression, participation in life really transformed. So that was a beginning. There are many beginnings. I think there are many people who were, it was a real flourishing time, I think. And I think one of the things that happened for John Kabat-Zinn was that he got on the Bill Moyers program and it really supported his you know, work. And a lot of things have come from that. Yeah, many, many of the mindfulness programs we now use have come from that, his kind of shaping of that four foundations of mindfulness, really. So with the science thing, you can see objectivity. You want to know not just my subjective experience, but that how does it affect you know, all of us, populations of people who are anxious and depressed, whatever. Um, it's a third person psychology in that term. So it's, it's investigating not just a personal experience, but what happens to a whole lot of people when they practice this stuff. And that's really important in our culture because we're interested in, if we're putting health dollars or organisational dollars to, towards a program, we want to know and be able to assess its helpfulness, huh? And the values are slightly different. They're very interested in safety, evidence-based practice across populations, and also efficiency and productivity. Quite different kind of emphasis direction. And then there's the market, 
so the science might call this mindfulness thing an intervention. Um, then in terms of the market, it's a product. We, we really, and we've probably all had to think in some terms about our offering as a product. Um, however, that might, you know, not sit quite so well with you, but yeah, we exist in this world, huh? And it has quite different concerns, growth, scalability, use of technology probably, and different values. So valuing um, an identity of a particular product. I think there's so many different kinds of mindfulness offerings these days because everyone wants to make their own so that they can be differentiated from other products even though it's not that different probably. Uh, and mindfulness and science in the market paradigm just become commodities. They're things to be wrangled so you can sell them well. huh? So there's a lovely saying from the Tibetan tradition about trust your exp experience but keep refining your view. And I think that's really helpful in terms of even keep reflecting, maybe using um, an idea of perspective of what paradigm I'm operating in right now, what matters to me right now, so we can take responsibility for what we're then bringing forth. So I want to have a bit of fun now and talk about there's all these different kinds of mindfulness, but there's many kind of shenanigans going on. I love that word, don't you? <laughs> um, so one of the shenanigans is that science is being used in simplistic ways that perhaps oversell the benefits and the complexity of this experience. So the brain, the neuroscience, is one area where this is really happening. So this incredibly complex phenomena that's being researched as best we can with the technology we've got so far is really um, the mindfulness literature, literature has a tendency to really dumb it down and make it into kind of simplistic models in order to tell eight-year-olds about it, to tell high-stressed workers about it. We want to do this really quickly and simply. What are the problems that comes with some of these metaphors? And I'm sure all of us have used these metaphors in teaching people mindfulness. Just add a few tools to your toolbox or, you know, train your brain. I've certainly used them because it kind of makes sense to people, huh? It's just like doing your biceps, just, you know, train your old brain. All good, except maybe, I think it really gives some wrong expectations. So this is the uh, straight line of progress. Huh? You train your brain, you train your arm, and you get stronger, and it gets sort of, a, uh, you know, you get more resilient, and you get more grounded, and you don't yell at your kids as much, and it's all a beautiful straight line. Really? What about the pragmatic, experiential, lived reality? I call this the wiggly line of disendarkenment. <laughs> and I'm sure if you've practiced mindfulness more than a week, you know about the wiggly line of disendarkenment, that actually, hmm, really? Things come up. It's not this kind of, yeah. It's a profound undertaking of grappling with existential realities, and we're getting derailed all the time. And the disendarkenment term, I want to honour Patrick Kearney. He's a meditation teacher who comes to Perth, actually, runs for Pasana um, meditation retreats. If you ever can catch a retreat with him, he's really good value. So some scientists have got together and written this article recently, which I, I consider part of the backlash of that's happening about mindfulness because of this oversimplification. And, you know, things do arise and pass, so we're part of that. Uh, but some very serious, smart people who are deeply immersed in the practice and also deeply immersed in their field as neuroscientists have written this article. And, you know, have a read of it. Um, they're really challenging some of these simplistic ways of, uh, and what the research is actually showing. I actually think they've kind of gone overboard um, in their rigour, but I'm a practitioner who, you know, wants to get people to come and do courses because I think they're profoundly helpful for people. So. But I think we need to pay attention to this and know about it as practitioners and be careful. So this is from Willoughby Britain. She's a researcher in the States, an MBSR teacher. And she just offers us this really simple way if we're speaking about our courses that we use this kind of open-ended, flexible and very specific language rather than the reifying kind of this is going to cure, it's proved, it's this, but actually softer, huh? This, you know, this may indicate it's associated with some forms of meditation can happen, help, you know, some kinds of anxiety and depression. Just being a bit humble, I think that's beautiful. And also, 
because the studies are done on populations of people, we can't promise any individual with anxiety that in eight weeks it's actually going to be that different. So it depends on so many causes and conditions, that transformation. So yeah, I think it's just wise to be a bit humble and communicate in this way. The other thing we need to do is define the offering. So another article that you might want to check out if you haven't already by some yeah, experts in the field in terms of the science and also the Dharma, the kind of Buddhist psychology aspect of things. And they've been interested in this question because there's so many different kinds of programs. What defines mindfulness-based programs? And they also do a little bit of an analysis of where the science is up to in terms of um, maturity. And so these are some of the things they've said about what, mind, what defines mindfulness-based programs. So it draws on contemplative traditions and science, underpinned by a model of human experience, which addresses the cause of human distress and the pathways to relieving it. Now that's really pointing to Buddhist psychology. Uh, it has this new relationship with experience, this approach orientation, huh? decentering. I mean, stuff you guys will just resonate with and know. Develops, as well as attention on emotional behavioural self-regulation, it's also cultivating wisdom, compassion, equanimity, these other qualities, very important in mindfulness-based programs. And it involves a sustained intensive training in mindfulness meditation. And I think that's quite an uh, important kind of distinguishing element. And just to get clear about maybe mindfulness-based involves that kind of meditative training for people and mindfulness-informed uh, maybe doesn't have all these aspects. And for us as practitioners of this and teachers of this, that we're aware of those distinctions and know what we're offering and know what we're inviting people into. And I think the level of teacher training required if you are actually inviting people into longer practice, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, is quite different than if you're doing five minutes of practice or a bit of mindful walking or, you know, I think it's quite different in terms of what you have to know and embody. So, the second shenanigan, the media loves lists and one-liners and thin white women. <laughs> the media loves looking at thin white women, doesn't like talking to them, but it actually, it actually really likes talking to, ah, oh, the slides are missing, but the slide is, uh, the media also loves chunky, older, robed men. <laughs> and it loves talking to them. They're kind of the holders of wisdom, unlike these thin white women. Um, this is courtesy of Nicholas Van Dam, a colleague in Melbourne who's a neuroscientist dude. So we all know who this is. Matthew Ricard, 69-year-old, says, look, you know, happiest man in the world, the secret's just 15 minutes a day thinking kind of happy thoughts. We've got to read the fine print. So you can start by thinking those happy thoughts, very good. And if you practice for 50 years, like Matthew has, very good, you can become very happy. You also need to be born into a very privileged, educated, loving family. A father who's a remarkable philosopher, a mother who's a brilliant painter and an ex-Buddhist nun. And probably you could get a PhD under the guidance of a Nobel laureate and train and live with the Dalai Lama for 50 years. <laughs> Tick. Done. Brilliant. Let's do it. Easy. So the third shenanigans is about the illusion of choice. So I think a lot of interventions are being offered in the mindfulness world at the moment, which are about letting people escape from their aversion. So, oh, you don't like the body scan? I oh, just do the awareness of breath. Oh, you don't like doing it for 30 minutes? Just do it for 10 minutes. Oh, just do a bit of mindful walking if that pisses you off, you know, do whatever, you know. And sh sure, any bit of practice for some people is gold, like it absolutely needs to be titrated for who is there in the room with you and what they are up for, what they've signed up for. This is absolute, and, and many people can use practice like that. But if people are up against it, if they are really stressed, relationship breakdown, anxiety, depression, loss, grief, um, financial worries. They actually are probably going to need more practice than that. So for us to occupy this space where we're offering all this choice is just training in aversion. It's training people to avoid their pain, which is not a mindfulness-based or a mindfulness-informed kind of practice. So 
my niece, and it raises this question of does mindfulness work, right? My niece, when she was 12, we went down to Margaret River for Christmas and she got this surfboard, right? So she takes the surfboard. It wasn't a very big day that day, so it was lucky. She goes out, 10 minutes later, comes back, throws it down on the ground. It doesn't work, right? The surfboard doesn't work, damn it! Um, and I hear this about mindfulness, and then you inquire a little bit about what actual practice people have done or what context it was offered in, or, you know, and it's not going to work, right? Just like the surfboard can't. It's actually a very nuanced and tender thing to engage in a practice, I think, and needs care, needs time. You can't just kind of add it to a busy life, maybe, to, if, if you're really under the pump. Um, so, whether it works or not depends on intention and invested time and apps are going to be a great uh, start for some people um, but again if you really got some serious suffering going on you're probably going to have to do more and if you want to know the nature of reality you're probably going to have to do even more like that dude on the right side so the question is for what does it work for what uh, and i think that's a brilliant question for us to keep in mind I think there's some ongoing confusion about mindfulness and meditation. Um, so in the way I think about this, there's formal practice, which I would call mindfulness meditation, and then there's informal practice, which is applying present moment attention to whatever you're doing, working, cooking, showering, walking, beautiful. And, and both are enormously important from the Buddhist psychology point of view. But what's happening now is mindfulness is kind of being talked about as if it's nothing to do with meditation. And I think, again, like that illusion of choice, I think it's like, say I had a bad back and someone said, oh, you really should do Pilates, but don't bother going to a teacher and actually doing classes and learning how to reorganise your interoception so you know something about your legs and your muscles and how to pick up your kid. Don't bother doing any of that formal training in it. Just do everyday Pilates. So when you pick up your kid, just make sure that you're activating those core muscles and not those other muscles. And really? I just don't think we're up for that. I don't think, and my experience of teaching people is people can't do that unless they really spend a little bit of time dropping into the actual practice and learning movements of mind, learning how they mind, really investigating the patterns of their sensations emotions, thoughts, and how they kind of um, create and contribute to the kind of stuckness that we get into as humans. So I would think, I think of mindfulness, if we're teaching mindfulness, then mindfulness is a kind of adjective. Mindfulness meditation as opposed to, you know, Vedantic meditation or, you know, and the formal practice leads to more awareness in our daily life we really start noticing what increases and decreases suffering personally for us, not some theoretical abstract thing. And then we have more choices and we probably feel more inclined to practice because we go, oh, phew, this has really helped. I'm going to keep doing this as part of my life. So a fifth shenanigans is I think, and this is happening just because it's going to happen in any field, but. A lot of people with very little experience or training in mindfulness practice and applications are becoming experts. And I think this happens in two contexts. It happens in the context of people just doing a really short course, like a weekend, and then you know adding that tool to their toolbox as a clinician or practitioner or teacher or whatever. And there can be some real benefit in that. Like lots of the things can just be added to a portfolio of things that you do. Um, but I think it's a real problem to consider yourself an expert or that you're actually, I think we need to make a relationship with the traditions about what it takes to, to really know this stuff. And certainly if you're leading people in any form of practice, you need to actually do more training than that. I have a lot of health professionals, you know, wonderful open-hearted people who come to even the eight-week MBSR course, which is just a training in mindfulness. And, you know, people so often say, yeah, I've been teaching mindfulness for years with my clients and stuff. And they find it very difficult to sit for 30 minutes and paying attention to their own mind. They find that really aversive and horrible. So it's hard unless you can know your own mind and can sit with your own aversion to invite people into that. It's just not going to be possible. You're going to be, um, you're going to be doing that illusion of choice thing. Oh, don't worry, I know it's horrible. Don't, do, don't bother doing it. Really? 
So the other context this is happening, and a colleague, Paul Grossman, who's a researcher, um, he says this is happening in universities all over the world, that people get to do a PhD in mindfulness with no practice. <laughs> and so they are shaping the field. Then they're going to become a supervisor and be able to supervise other people doing PhDs in mindfulness with no practice particularly. Or That's a problem. If we think of those three paradigms, I think we all have to be, I mean, I'm never going to be that interested in science, actually. It's just not an interest of mine, except in the thing that it supports what I love teaching and it, it supports me thinking, okay, this is valuable for me, but, I'm, but I need to be a little bit across it. I need to be across the paradigms and I think we all need to know something about Buddhist psychology and the practice if we're teaching this stuff seriously and we certainly want to even have mindfulness teacher or, you know, using this in your work. I think you've got to immerse yourself a bit um, to be responsible for, what, for the trajectory of this precious offering in the world. If we look at Buddhism, there's a many sorts. This is really sort of chunking it down. So there's a focus in some sorts of Buddhism, Zen and Tibetan particularly, on this present moment focused view of mindfulness. And there's people in the room who are much better placed to talk about that than me. But um, so that this idea that sudden transformation, realization is possible if we just abide in the present moment. All qualities of awakening are present in ordinary minds. They're available, accessible, very democratic actually, beautiful sensibility. Mindfulness involves present moment awareness. That's what you need to kind of abide in. Mindfulness involves non-judgmental quality of mind. And there's an emphasis on non-conceptual knowing. So John Kabat-Zinn was very immersed in Zen practice as well as Theravadan practice. So I think we've all been shaped by this idea of the present moment as being a doorway and a gateway. Where it gets confusing, I think, is, and it, it tips into that idea of, you know, the illusion of choice or just doing everyday mindfulness, is that these present moment dudes, you know, were practicing their butts off in the present moment. It's not like they were just going, oh, I'll just be in the present moment. <laughs> that'll that'll uh, do something for me. Very important. That's essential. But the formal practice is also important. So on the cultivation over time focus, the constructivist tradition, uh, there's an emphasis on the gradual development over time leads to transformation. Special qualities of mind get created through the practice, get developed. They're not already just there. Mindfulness involves remembering and recollecting past experiencing and deliberately shaping future experiences. So really making active choices in your practice. And so not just non-conceptual, right? But actually reflecting. And mindfulness meditation practice involves discerning, comparing, analyze, reflecting on practice experience. So very different kind of emphasis. And an emphasis on the use of concepts to cultivate awakening. So this is important for us if we're wanting to occupy a place of holding this tradition, contributing to the development of it, I think. You know, for many practitioners and mindfulness teachers it may not be so important, but I think just getting fine about that, because I think there's some confusion about it, and certainly if you're teaching people practice, like longer practices or if you're leading retreats, this confusion's going to come up for your participants unless you're across it and kind of, you know, can listen to it and can hear it. And I've been involved with Dr. Maura Kinney. She's an MBCT expert in Australia. And she and I have written a paper about this that I'll make sure it's available through Ron if you want to read about the kind of importance of this for ordinary mindfulness teachers to just have a handle on this. And it's, it's often why the training of mindfulness teachers gets a bit perplexing. There's this tension going on all the time about how do you answer that practice question? How do you respond to it? Where's the person coming from? What's going to be most important? I just came across this other fantastic article by Sebastian uh, Voros, and I can also make that available to you about this very thing. So if you're interested. So the other th shenanigans is just, well, it's just a dilemma for us, I think. How do we, if we care about this thing, how can we bring it forth so it's not just business as usual and it can actually contribute to changing the social relations. I think, as Ron said, it has power to do this in our schools, in our communities, in our business communities. But how do we contribute in a way that that can happen? And I just wanted to land here. 
and maybe having a moment to, com to connect with our own compelling reasons for being interested in this. And just orient maybe to our own basic goodness. I think we're all probably here very interested in how to catalyse greater wisdom and compassion in our worlds, in our culture, in our families. And I've just thrown out some questions that we'll just let land and then maybe we'll open up to questions from you guys. Just what qualifies as adequate teacher training for different contexts? And it probably is quite different. Is the teacher having experiential understanding of mindfulness through practice and retreats? Not just conceptual understanding. Is this an important standard for our work or not? How do we communicate ethically precisely and effectively about the benefits of mindfulness practice. The market demands skew us away from that, I think. Um, but it's an important question. Is mindfulness being used to describe programs that are more accurately defined as social emotional leadership programs? I think there's quite a lot of offerings now that are adding the mindfulness word to it because it's kind of a bit famous and there's all this neuroscience, but they actually don't teach practice. They don't really refer to any of the kind of underpinnings or, you know, so I think that's an interesting question for us to really get clearer and, yeah, why are we using that word? You might just call it attentional training, in fact. A lot of the research these days that, uh, that university students are doing is, um, yeah, really, because um, they've got such constraints, they're really just attentional training things, not so much to do with the whole body of mindfulness. How do we contribute so these mindfulness programs are reaching the people that most need them and are empowering rather than re-traumatising? There's a whole storm at the moment about that. How do we be honest about what is needed in terms of the kind of group, the teacher, the practice to meet serious needs and intentions? So it's different, I think, for different contexts, what is actually required. And we shouldn't be... F we've got to be honest about that because otherwise people are, it's not going to work for them. Are we paying attention to the things that matter? Personal success, ease, attractiveness versus inequity, democracy, climate change, food and water sustainability. I think, sometimes I think, why am I even interested in this? I should just be being an activist, really, because it's going to hell in a handbasket and we need to act. And this is my particular flavour of things. Um, what if mindfulness could be more about intimacy with this life and clearer responsibility for my place in things? rather than inhibiting my amygdala or being more productive. <laughs> Yeehaw! <laughs> I love that quote. I just discovered this writer. She's beautiful.